Joining us now is Mark Ames. He's a senior editor at Pando. How you doing, Mark? Good. How you doing? Doing really well, man. And I should just say as a heads up to our listeners, Mark is joining us uh, from the field. And by field, I yep. mean a park by his apartment where he is needed to and has been so generous, frankly, uh, to sort of get away from his, uh, his family and his amazing uh, newborn to uh, join us for a little while. So appreciate it, man. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, my son has already said he's going to remember you forever for this. But uh, Really? Oh, oh yeah. He well, has a long memory. He's I love born it. pissed off. Yeah, I, well, of course he's pissed off. <laughs> um, yeah. I appreciate that. So there'll be some, we could make probably some type of like gangster grudge match vehicle about, you know, there you go. between me and your son. I'm, I'm open to it. Um, be careful. He's big. He's already big. So be careful. Dude, uh, yeah, I, I'm careful, but I'm crafty. Um, so you have this really, really interesting new piece uh, in Pando called uh, Seymour Hirsch and the Dangers of Corporate Muckraking. And what I liked so much about this piece is it hits a lot of themes that you that you hit a lot, Mark, which is sort of like really sort of shedding light on why is it easier on both the left and right to sort of expose government malfeasance, which is important. You're in no way uh, diminishing or undermining the importance of those stories. But there's also this corporate power, this corporate corollary, and all of these issues we talk about um, that isn't addressed in the same way. Is that another kid? It is. It's yeah. a park here. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, but so let's get. But you explained Seymour Hirsch. The way the story starts is in the is basically in Seymour Hirsch's sort of heyday in the 1970s. He's exposed the My Lai massacre. He's at the New York Times, and he wants to take on corporate power. Take us from there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was just. Um, it started with me actually being curious. Why hasn't this? You know, the, sort of the most bloodthirsty, aggressive. Um, uh, you know, impressive muckraker, uh, as they call him of our time. Like, why hasn't he gone after corporate private power the way he has after uh, government public power, knowing that muckraking, you know, the original muckrakers uh, went almost, you know, more so than after government power, they went after um, private corporate power, which right. rose up uh, in, in the late 19th century. Uh, Rock, you know, Rockefeller, Standard Oil, uh, the coal companies, so on and so forth. And so I wondered that, and I looked, and, it was, and there was actually a story about what happened. Seymour Hersh, you know, he was considered hit politically very much on the left. He, Abe Rosenthal used to call him my little commie. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of ironically, affectionately in the newsroom at the New York Times. And it turned out that Hersh himself decided after, you know, after the Milai expose and after the, the really big expose on CIA domestic spying in 75, uh, 74, 75, the MH, MH chaos program in which the CIA illegally, you know, uh, spied on uh, probably up to hundreds and thousands of Americans right. um, leading to the church committee and all that. He said after that, OK, the next big story in the next 10 years is corporate power. And, you know, the, the thing you have to remember is that back then and his biographer talked about this, too, in the 70s the basic assumptions were very different about, you know, private corporate power versus government power. The basic assumptions, people were far more openly, and the culture was uh, more openly um, uh, skeptical of, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's not hostile towards corporate power. Right. And it was much more on the front and center of people's thoughts. You know, today you have all these, like, bizarre assumptions that somehow co private power, corporate power, is not as dangerous um, as government power. As if, for example, one of the falsehoods I hear a lot: oh, well, companies, private companies, can't put you behind bars the way a government can. That's that's just BS. I mean, they you know, operate when I private prisons, for God's sake. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, they operate them, but they constantly work with law enforcement to put people behind bars all the time. I mean, right. I wrote about eBay uh, doing this. Like the eBay, the head of the security for eBay, at one conference with uh, with a bunch of police and FBI people bragged about how eBay in just a short period of time had put away, um, you know, thousands of arrests around the globe with their global security force. Uh, anybody who knows anything about the PayPal 14 um, knows that eBay PayPal ran the prosecution. I mean, it's a pretty 
shocking case if you ever read it. Um, they ran the whole prosecution of that case against the PayPal board. So circling um, back, circling so, back to Hirsch for a minute, so to, to so, get back yeah, to the story. Yeah. So and no, yeah, and I he, think that that's a really interesting point, though. Just a side note that he, in the seventies, even with this very different attitude, he was anticipating the environment and the climate of the seventies and eighties, which would set the stage for the assumptions you're talking about today, which was the kind of neoliberal backlash, and that was the sort of empowerment of corporations. So he saw it as a perceptive muckraker and journalist in the 1970s? He, he had a nose for where um, coercive, uh, you know, coercive power was. And coercive power is both in the, you know, in the military and in intelligence areas in the government, and then in the, these you know, huge new growing uh, corporations. And so he went after, he chose uh, to go after what was a, a very infamous company of its time in the 60s and 70s called Gulf and Western. Um, one Explain of Gulf and Western to us a little bit. I mean, you got yeah. this mafia-connected lawyer who's involved in it. You got, I mean, yeah. it, it's a, it's amazing. I mean, just just bring out that company a little bit, bring it to life a little bit, and because it's also just a great target for anybody who has a sense of what a good story is. I mean, it's it's mind blowing the power and reach of this company and the intimacy between, you know, the the criminal economy and the corporate economy. There's a lot to it. And the characters. I mean, and it had characters. great characters. And yeah. it shows, again, you know, that, that Hirsch has always had a great nose for a good story. Um, the problem, as, we'll, you know, as I'll tell you in a minute, was what happens when you try to write about corporate power. You have to bring in the lawyers and the editors in a way you don't have to when you write about government. So in any event, Gulf and Western began in the 50s as, uh, as, a, as an auto parts company. And it was run by this guy who was the New Yorker in the 90s after he was dead called, called the last great business eccentric. Um, his name was Charlie uh, Blue Dorn. He was also known as the Mad Austrian. He was originally from Austria. Um, and uh, he, you know, had a lot of energy. And um, uh, uh, he, he was, you know, notoriously aggressive as hell and scary. And um, he wound up he wound up striking up basically a really good relationship first with, um, uh, with Chase uh, Chase Bank and then with Ma uh, uh, what is it Hanover Manhattan I think was the other one mm -hmm. uh, manufacturers Hanover I'm sorry and these banks basically uh, you know they they opened up the spigot for him to finance an acquisition spree and the banks made money kind of on both ends because the more like they would have clients on one end and, and then, you know, uh, Gulf and Western on the other end, and they would make money off both ends on the deal. So they were encouraged to really keep uh, financing these acquisitions that he would make. And he wanted to do it because his stock price would go, the more he would acquire, the, the more value the company had, and the more his stock price went up, and the more leverage he would then get over the bank to pull out personal loans. And it was a very, very convoluted and... Um, you know, uh, fraud ridden, uh, it sounds very moderate. It, it, it does. But yeah. you know, you start to think about what the banks did here in the two thousands or what the, the SNL did. I mean, they, they basically load up, yeah. uh, on borrowed money, uh, and then turn it into their personal ATM. That's kind of what he did, right. um, with Gulf and Western. And, you know, he really attracted a lot of attention when he bought Paramount pictures, uh, in 66, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, and then in '68, uh, he attracted more attention when he cut this very strange deal with one of the most notorious uh, mafia financiers, you know, of the 20th century, Michelle Sindona. Um, Michelle Sindona was uh, he ran the money laundering for the Sicilian mafia's global heroin operations. He was also known as God's banker because he had the ear of one of the popes, and he did all, he, he managed the, the Vatican's global properties. He also helped the CIA move money around the world. And in 68, 69, he cut a deal with Gulf and Western, um, which, by the way, was considered, Gulf and Western was so aggressive that Wall Street nicknamed them and Gulf and Devour. And if you've ever seen that Mel Brooks movie, silent movie, the evil corporation in it was called in Gulf and Devour as a movie from the mid 70s. Right. In any event, um, so, uh, so, you know, one of the, uh, 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 one of the companies, subsidiaries that Gulf and Western bought, I think it was called Commercial something or other, anyway, it was some man, uh, New Hampshire company. It was totally worthless, and it was creating a problem for the books, uh, you know, for Gulf and Western's books. So somehow they managed to 
swap uh, three, I can't remember how many millions of dollars worth of totally worthless commercial paper in the subsidiary mm-hmm. with Michelle Sendona's um, uh, Italian finance company, a 10% stake in that company. And then they swap back half of Paramount Pictures um, uh, movie lot back to Sendona. And then they asked Sendona about it afterwards. And he said, I like to give uh, pieces of companies undervalued to friends who I want to do favors for. I mean, it just makes like no sense whatsoever. Unless um, you're it, a Sicilian financier, then that might yes. make some sense. <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, so, you know, this was just one of the many uh, shady schemes um, that, that, uh, that Hirsch wound up getting into. Another one is they own basically the largest employer in the Dominican Republic where, you know, the U.S. has, uh, has been intervening militarily right. and otherwise you know, throughout the whole century. And, and they basically, I mean, they own the sugar business there, um, right. Gulf and Western did. They own the sugar refinery. They were the largest employer. And they, when the, when the uh, Dominican Republic Central Bank needed more money on its books, uh, Gulf and Western would illegally funnel money their way against SEC rules. And when Gulf and Western needed more money on its books, uh, you know, to, to try to boost the share, the Dominican Republic Central Bank would funnel money back into their accounts. It was all just, it was crazy. So, so you have everything. Um, you have mafia. Yeah. You have incredible, just sort of rampant corporate criminality. You have our policy of coup and dictatorship in Latin America, and then seeing the trend of corporate power. So Hirsch <laughs> sees all of this, and this is going to be his next major expose. Exactly. So he um, so he goes to the New York Times and says, "This is going to be the big story. Like I've already proven, I have a nose for this stuff. I have a Pulitzer." corporate power, and this company uh, embodies everything that's wrong with um, overweening uh, corporate power in this country. These guys are now the 19th largest um, employers. They're violating every rule in the book. They're, they're not using the money to sort of innovate and, and grow and, I mean, you know, and do something good. They're, they're actually just using the money as personal ATMs. And so he gets to go ahead. Everybody's, everybody's totally for it. And he winds up hooking up with Jeff uh, Gerth, uh, who's now ProPublica. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he, he did like the Whitewater. Uh, I think he first broke the Whitewater stories in the 90s. Anyway, oh. um, uh, and they wound up spending, you know, a very long time digging into um, Gulf and Western and all of the problems they're having. And, and um, there was a lot of buildup, like, oh, my God, Hirsch is going after corporate America now. And there's a lot of, like, anticipation of the story, what would happen when it finally came out. Um, and in, in mid-1977, they finally released a series. It was a three-part series, 13,000 words in total. Um, and it landed with a whimper, an absolute whimper. The stories are, are dull, turgid. Mm. Everything, everything a, um, a Seymour Hersh story is not, you know, right. um, and, uh, you know, and, and then and then you start going back into well, why, how did that happen? Why did the stories have so little effect and why are they so unreadable and such a disappointment? And well, then we found out the whole process Hersh had to go through to even get these stories published. And what happens is, I mean, they, when you're a journalist and you want to go after a company, first of all, companies can do a lot more to journalists. They can threaten you in far bigger and worse ways. Overtly. Yeah, explain that um, a little bit. That's because I think people, again, intuitively, they'd say, well, wait a second. If you're going up against the NSA or the CIA or, you know, a covert intelligence or military opera- uh, organization that has, you know, vast surveillance powers, is involved in all sorts of extrajudicial things, how can a corporation have more overt power? It, it makes total sense to me, but, you know, tease that out a little bit. Well, I mean, first of all, they're considered people, right? <laughs> right? You. And, yeah. uh, a, 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 you know, under our laws. And um, the, the government is constrained by the Constitution. The government is constrained by the Constitution that, you know, it, that, um, uh, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we're all, you know, worried about these days, that, you know, it shouldn't be able to surveil you. I mean, a, somebody can hire a private detective. Right. Right? And, and yeah. it's, I mean, it's legal. Now, maybe you can sue them, but you can't. Uh, if you can, you know, if you can prove some kinds of damages uh, to your life, um, you can maybe sue them. Um, but, so, so uh, really quick, so basically just, I mean, I want you to fill it, but like an example would be like if the, if the FBI or the CIA send people to follow and monitor a journalist who's covering them, that's a big deal. 
A corporation yeah. can hire any private contractor they want to do yeah. anything they want to, I mean, short of obviously like physical harm, but they can go through somebody's garbage. They can, you know, that's par for the course. Well, and as Hirsch and the people writing about Hirsch's story said in, in the 70s as well, um, the things that Gulf and Western said and did, I mean, they o openly threatened um, uh, Hirsch many times. They did everything to try to get him and, and, and Jeff Griff fired. They openly told Hirsch, um, you know, we, we're digging up information on your families and on Jeff Griff's father that's going to be very damaging. They told him that straight up. No yep. fear whatsoever. Now, and, and as they said at the time, everybody said, if that happened in the government, you'd have resignation. You'd have a huge ongoing, you know, story, and then you'd have people resigning. Nobody in private government, you know, let's call them private government, yeah. that's what they are, yeah. uh, resigns over that. And they don't, and, you know, it's assumed these days, um, uh, our cultural assumption is that their only, um, you know, failty is only to, uh, and their only responsibility is to their shareholders to maximize profit. They don't have any responsibility to, you know, to the public whatsoever. And they don't have to. They're not constrained by the Constitution. So, um, so you know, what Hirsch found out was that, um, was that going after these guys, the threats of lawsuits were so great. I mean, the NSA, you know, the CIA couldn't threaten, uh, didn't threaten to sue, uh, you know, the, the New York Times. Um, over, over Hirsch exposing the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the domestic spying program. They, they weren't going right. to, like, sue the, the, uh, the New York Times out of existence. And, in fact, the New York Times had already won, you know, landmark First Amendment rights cases in the Supreme Court about its right to, to publish uh, the Pentagon Papers and, and other classified documents. So, you know, the, the New York Times knew that it's protected against the public government power, um, but it's not protected. And we all know this. Every journalist knows this. Every journalist knows that, you know, you might fear in the back of your head that the government could do something secretly without you ever knowing that could screw up your life, you know, or mm -hmm. there's a fear that they'll kill you or, you know, whatever. Um, but, but, but we know that they are actually constrained um, and, they, and they can't get away with it. But, but with private corporations, first of all, you can't FOIA them. Right. Um, you know, and good luck suing them. I mean, uh, right. what, what's Jeff Gerst going to do? Sue uh, Gulf and Western for threatening, uh, for threatening him? You know, who's got the money for that? Right. These guys were clearly ready to go all out um, to make life hell for them, and they did. And so the New York Times, unlike any of his stories on the CIA or the Mili Massacre or anything, um, they held up the story. They made it go through. They, they have lawyers vetting it in, in ways that none of his stories about government were vetted. They had editors. They put a team of editors on it. Um, they were threatened, you know, repeatedly. Hirsch himself said that the experience from Gulf and Western's executives and their lawyers and the, the abuse that he put up with and the threats that he put up with was unlike anything by far that he had ever dealt with when investigating the CIA or the military. He'd never dealt with anything like it. And he didn't want to repeat the experience again. He was destroyed by it. Yeah. The article came out like crap. And he just thought, you know, as a career move, it's a bad career move. Uh, it's not worth it to, to fight um, corporate power. And so he, he never wrote about corporations again after that. He went back to writing about Henry Kissinger. You know, we all hate Henry Kissinger. And uh, there's no fear of, uh, you know, of, of the sort of retaliation that he had to deal with um, when writing about uh, 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 you know, Gulf and Western Well, and for what it's worth, for all of the writing about Henry Kissinger that's sort of been exhaustively done, there's not as much you know, written about his, uh, his private consulting work. Um, so uh, that's... And, yeah, and, 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 good and, point. And even so, um, what's fascinating about the article, too, is that you know, this, uh, these articles, as sort of boring and as pared down as they became, actually did have an effect on Hirsch's target and on uh, Gulf and Western. So even that said, it still had some impact. I, mean, I guess Some we, impact, yeah. eventually. It just wasn't the dramatic impact right. that people expected. I mean, you know, again, the big series he did before that, the, the CIA domestic spying program, had the greatest effect, I think, of, I mean, besides the, the Watergate stories, right. the greatest effect of pretty much any you know, muckraking of our time, which was the church committee hearings and the Pike committee hearings and the Rockefeller commission. I mean, it was, 
that that you know rippled for years afterwards. And um, I think Hirsch's bad experience um, and the New York Times' bad experience going after corporate power and going after Gulf and Western in such a deep, profound way. You know, I mean, he wasn't just going after one thing they did. He really went after. It's kind of fascinating. He went after the companies, both their sort of the wrongdoings, but also kind of structurally, right. you really got, he pulled, peeled the whole thing open. And, you know, corporations want to live in secrecy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, as do spy agencies. I mean, that's, I think, another thing that attracted him to this. Um, and, um, and he really kind of peeled it open. You got to look at a conglomerate um, on a lot of different levels in a way that, that uh, hadn't been done before. And, and really hasn't been done since. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things I think I'm learning writing about corporate power here in the technology sector and haven't looked, you know, and haven't written a bit about uh, certainly like the Koch brothers and, um, and uh, finance is how little we actually understand about the architecture of corporate power today. I, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely a lot different from the conglomerate architecture that Hirsch wrote about. I mean, that was a new thing in the 60s and 70s. The conglomerates were, were then destroyed. Um, uh, it's a whole other story. But they, they kind of went by the wayside and new, new structures kind of came up in, in the years since then. And we don't understand anything. We do not even, no one could tell you the structure of Google or Facebook. I mean, the full structure, uh, eBay, you know, um, Coke Industries, for that matter. Like, no one can tell you the structure of it. There, there are no, uh, you know, NGOs that are dedicated to transparency of corporate architecture and corporate power. Um, you know, the only, the only place that people seem to be interested at all in corporate power is where it intersects with government power, which really just reinforces you know, the whole focus on government power. Right. Um, and that, and you see, that's so important because I think that that's been, a, a, you know, as we sort of move to closing this up, that's been something that you have really focused on a lot. And it's very important. Um, and obviously exposing NSA surveillance, exposing all of this, uh, you know, all of these covert programs that have happened under basically the war on terrorism framework through Bush and Obama, is incredibly important. But even as we look at, like, you know, the supposed reform bills in Congress to rein in aspects of the Patriot Act, well, first of all, obviously they're incredibly limited and tepid reforms. But a lot of it is just sort of turning into, like, well, you know, government doesn't store metadata. Now the phone companies just will. And basically, yeah, first of all, yeah, government will have access to it whenever they want, regardless. And then, you know, this whole other question, which is that these companies whose whole sort of business model is built off of uh, just incredibly sophisticated data mining, essentially. No one's talking about a sort of 21st century framework for consumer protections and for transparency and for how, you know, the, the sort of digital equivalents of putting seatbelts in cars. That conversation has been off the table because there isn't this scrutiny on corporate power, like you've pointed out. And then we have these anecdotes like you know uber some people have taken shots at them pretty minimal shots and there you already have a ceo at a dinner saying like hey maybe i should you know i should uh send some uh private detectives after people who say negative stuff about us that was the, my editor actually right. Lacey. Yeah, yeah it was emil emil michael the executive there yeah um saying he was going to put a lot of money a million dollars into um following and smearing her fam and her family actually Right. She's got two children. Um, yeah, that, and, uh, you know, no fallout from that. I mean, look, the, the Snowden, I, you know, if you ask the Snowden revelations, the most, the most significant ones and the ones I wish so badly that were followed up on, and I think a lot of other journalists do. Well, uh, the, the Verizon one, you know, was big and great, and it confirmed, I think, the, the USA Today exposés in, in 2006. The PRISM ones, the ones about Silicon Valley uh, big tech companies, you know, working together with them. That, that to me was, that was the big one. And, and that one, we haven't really heard anything about NSA. And tech. We've heard very little about NSA and tech since then from, from the documents. And we've heard nothing about contractors. And, you know, we know from Tim Chirac that 70% um, of the NSA is already privatized. 70% of the budget outlays go to contractors for the NSA. So it's more of a private organization than a public one. 
And, you know, part of that obviously is that people can make money. And part of that is also when you have this murky public private thing, um, accountability and legal accountability become themselves that much more murky. Um, and uh, so I, you know, it's really, it's, it's disappointing that so much of the story has since, you know, just com- almost exclusively focused on big, you know, big bad government. The government obviously in this case is bad, but it's not, you're not really getting the story. It would be at least as bad if they only went after the companies and said nothing bad whatsoever about the NSA, uh, you know, and only went after sort of like the companies that were doing something. Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't know why that's the case. It's, it's hard for me to believe that out of the tens of thousands of documents, there's not more about contractors in there. Um, but, you know, we just don't know. I mean, I don't know why, uh, why we don't know more about that. It's, it's just a big part of the story that's, that seems to be missing, and hopefully it'll still come out. And, uh, you know, um, and it's a big part of the story in general that we're missing, I think, as, you know, that journalists aren't, aren't writing enough about. And, again, because it makes their life a lot harder, I'm saying, I mean, the corporate private side of all this stuff. Um, it's just a lot harder to do it. You have a lot more legal and sort of career roadblocks when you write about corporate power. Um, and when you challenge corporate power, than you do if you write about the government. I mean, I, you know, as a journalist, it's just, it's, it's easier culturally for people to understand these days, um, the, you know, the villain and the good guy. Uh, but more importantly, it's just easier to get it past your editor. They're not going to worry about getting sued out of existence if they write about uh, government malfeasance compared to corporate malfeasance. Absolutely. And just, you know, as a final thought, because I, I, a lot of this still also definitely goes back, and we've talked about the how this sort of, you know, the Scientology of politics, which is how I talk about libertarianism, <laughs> has kind of like, you know, yeah. defined so much of our era. And, you know, yeah. this is the problem. I mean, Practically speaking, and just even like civically, I'm you know I think building coalitions and where you can work with people on intelligence reform and on prison reform is great, and I'm willing to work with libertarians on those issues and have conversations. But there is such a fundamental problem because that that coalition and that conversation is only going to deal with the governmental aspect of this. And as you point out, with the role of contractors, even practically speaking, it's not really going to rein in an out-of-control in, out intelligence system. And then more broadly, it's going to do nothing to sort of lay the rules of the road uh, for how we manage, basically, you know, uh, tech capitalism and 21st yes. century capitalism. And that's the name of the game right now, as far as I'm concerned. Well, yeah, and I think culturally we kind of seeded, we just gave up on politics in some way by in the late 70s or early 80s. And so, you know, I, I mean, liberals before then, the, certainly like liberals from the progressive era to the New Deal era, were a lot more attuned to, you know, a corporate power and how coercive and, and destructive it could be. Uh, and I think because they were a lot more aligned with labor. Right. And so you understand these things a lot more. And, you know, you just think about it intuitively. I mean, the fear of what the NSA could do is, I mean, it's potentially, you know, uh, or, or willing, absolutely or willing what they could potentially do with all this information that they're getting. But in reality, in reality, the overwhelming majority of us are much more impacted by private technology, private uh, sector um, uh, surveillance, let's just say surveillance and, and you know, the use of, of private information about our credit histories, which may or may not be true, or our reputations, our online reputations, which, which may or may not be true. And we don't even, we can't FOIA to get access to, to this and have yeah. it change. And this may affect our ability to, you know, buy a car or to get a job or to get health insurance. You know, all these things actually affect our mundane lives. But um, uh, A, it's, it's less sexy than the possibility of an Orwellian, uh, you know, uh, uh, big brother state like, like, creating the, the sort of movie set, you know, horror film atmosphere. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, the dramatics are much bigger in the government. And, and then just, it's just, it's a lot harder to write about what the corporations are doing. It's harder to get it past your editors and it's harder to write about and it's harder to get information. Well, Mark Ames, I really appreciate you doing it. And it's always fun talking with you and always, uh, it's great. I appreciate your time as always, man. And I'll talk to you soon.